They told me to enjoy the moment, so I'm taking that moment. How would you feel if your phone suddenly went dark? How would you feel if you no longer had access to your bank account? How would you feel if you drove home tonight and your brakes no longer worked? Now imagine that this didn't just happen to you, it happened to millions of people all over our country and potentially millions more all over the world at the same time. What would you do about that? What would we do about that? Technology has transformed our lives at a dizzying pace. We depend on it for essentials now, our cell phone, our Wi-Fi. We rely on it for convenience, making a dinner reservation, remotely starting your car, and pretty soon, Technology will literally drive us to dinner. We are wild-eyed with excitement about the unprecedented ease and convenience that technology has ushered into our lives. But at the same time, we are blind to the threat of cybersecurity and how it can impact our lives with the click of a mouse. Target, Sony, WannaCry, all three are examples of cyber attacks that impact us at work and at play. Nothing is immune from a cyber attack, not even our democratic form of government. If Winston Churchill were alive today, he would probably say that the cyber threat is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Now look, we live in an economy that's based on competition. Companies are obsessed with bringing the most innovative products to market as fast as possible. Security, that's an afterthought. The tension between the private sector and the government is this. The private sector wants to bring products to market for profit. Meanwhile, the government is mandated to provide security without regard to cost. This tension is best exemplified in the Sony hack. In 2014, Sony was going to release a film that was a parody of the North Korean leader. The ensuing attack literally shut down the company. In an eerie foreshadowing of last year's DNC hack, the hackers released emails from Sony executives that disparaged Angelina Jolie and Adam Sandler. The hackers even threatened any theater that dared to show the film that they would be attacked, and it further delayed the release of the film. What started as a hack transformed itself into an assault on our First Amendment rights by a nation state. So here comes the U.S. government. They publicly said it was the fault of the North Korean government, and they vowed a proportionate response. So shortly thereafter, the entire North Korean internet was temporarily shut down. But I have to be honest with you, I'm not sure who exactly gets to use the North Korean internet. <laughs> Connectedness is another way that brings the cyber threat into very sharp focus. Superconnectedness provides unprecedented ease and convenience. I can whip out my cell phone, I can use an app, I can order lunch, organic no less, and have it delivered this theater probably within an hour. Conversely, that same superconnectedness also means that the cyber threat can adversely impact more people faster in a shorter amount of time than ever before. So the question is, how do we respond to this challenge? The simple but not easy answer is proactive private sector government collaboration. Such collaboration means real-time access to and sharing of cyber threat and attack information 
with the purpose of mitigating the consequences of an attack. Think of it this way. Your friend's bank is hacked in the morning. It's some malicious email that's fake, but because the bank is collaborating with the government and the other banks, they're able to transmit out a warning. As a result, the attack on your friend's bank in the morning is less likely to be an attack on your bank in the afternoon. Now I know what you're thinking. Oh, this sounds great in theory. But in practice, it's like Billy Joel, the piano man, wrote. It's a matter of trust. The private sector looks upon the government with suspicion over things like, one, should you even call the government if you get hacked? Two, should the government have the right to unlock your iPhone? Three, should there be regulation over artificial intelligence and robots? Now, the skeptics might say, well, this kind of collaboration is impossible. But we, as a society, we already do it without even thinking about it. How many of you have uploaded real-time traffic information to the app Waze? How many more of us are going to access that real-time information on the way home from the theater tonight to find the best route home to avoid traffic? Now, in the cyber world, the best example of this proactive collaboration is in the financial services industry. They call them an information sharing and analysis center. Yes, I'm going to use an acronym. It's called an ISAC. What the ISAC is designed to do, it's a platform, and it allows the government and industry representatives to have access to and to share real-time attack information, and they work together to respond to the threat or the attack. But what it also does is it allows people to create relationships. Think how much more difficult would it be to respond to a cyber attack if the team that you're going to put out on the field, they've never worked together before. And now you're going to ask them to respond to a cyber attack flawlessly under the stress of the situation. Cybersecurity is as serious as a heart attack, and we need to treat it that way. Target, Sony, WannaCry. More recently, let's add SEC, Equifax. They're all symptoms that, if left untreated, will undoubtedly at some point re result in an economic heart attack or possibly something worse. In this case, the doctor is prescribing proactive collaboration. Do we really want to find out from an economic heart attack that, you know what, we should have listened to the doctor's orders? I don't think so, because too much is at stake. Innovation happens so fast now that it has literally overwhelmed our ability to comprehend and understand its long-term consequences. This is especially true in cybersecurity, particularly as it relates to the balance between innovation and our security. Let me ask you the following two questions. Question one, what do you think the balance is between the benefit of artificial intelligence and robots versus the danger and potential destruction of the T-1000 and the drones that made Arnold Schwarzenegger famous in the Terminator movies? <laughs> Question two, how does government smartly respond to the complicated, interconnected systems that are required to operate self-driving cars, but also maintain this appropriate level of security? In a way, this is a trick question, because what I'm really asking you to do is please put on your turn signal, and we're going to temporarily exit the innovation superhighway, and we're going to pause. Pause so that we can wrap our head around the long-term consequences of innovation on our security. Now, we're in the 21st century. We're barely 17 years in. We've dealt with terrorism, financial meltdowns, multiple natural disasters. We are ready 
for the cyber challenge. Now, it's going to require this proactive collaboration, but it also means that we, as a society, need to engage in an open and honest debate about the consequences of innovation on our security. And that debate begins with you right now. So the next time that you purchase an Alexa, or pretty soon it's going to be your first self-driving car, pause for a moment. Consider what has been built into that platform to protect your privacy and provide for your ongoing security. Thank you. <sighs> Thank you.